There we go. Well, it is great to be with you. In case you haven't figured this out, I'm not Pastor David. All right. I'm Pastor John. I'm the, the lead pastor of Macau, of, of actually TFC, of all the campuses. And, and uh, I've been doing this for about 27 years. And so, yeah, God called us way back here. And, you know, we may tell you a little, little bit of the story of it. But uh, we've just seen God do some incredible things. It's been incredible. What God has done here in Wessico was it about seven years ago. This was planted seven, eight years ago. And, and I just really am excited about the growth, the spirit of this place. And, and I want you to know, I really believe with all of my heart that great things are ahead for Wessico. I, I'm looking for the near future that we're going to be able to have this entire building and have an outreach center that is going to reach into the central Rio Grande area. And we're going to see some incredible um, things through lives being changed, people being healed. And it's just glad that you guys are a part of that. So, you know, one of the things that's kind of been on my heart a lot um, lately is faith. You know, um, we came down here in the Rio Grande Valley 27 years ago by faith. You know, um, we, we've seen God do incredible things here by faith. And I believe that God wants to do things in your life by faith. But, but to kind of kick this off in kind of a direction I want to go, I want to start by talking a little bit about the opposite of faith, which is oppression. And, you know, oppression is a, is a very powerful thing that's going on in our world today where people are being oppressed of the place, literally of, you know, um, their lives are being shattered because of oppression. And, and if you look at, you know, the culture and and, and, and really the emphasis against op oppression, we're all for that. But what I want to talk about today is really the root of all oppression. I think sometimes we look at things and we just kind of see it from a natural perspective. And we, we you know, begin to think that the root or the author of things that are happening in our life are natural things. But the Bible has more to say about that. Um, it, it, it says in, in literally in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, in the 12th verse, it says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. So what it's saying here is a lot of the problems that you have in your life right now that you think they're natural based, they're really spiritually based. And it says we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Now, one of the things that I, I really have noticed, you know, I, I got saved in 1975, 76, and the world was a, a different place. A lot of you weren't even born then. And there was a different place back then. Spiritual things were more accepted than they are today. I've noticed in our culture, we've gotten to the place that we don't believe in spiritual things anymore. That's why a lot of people, even in the world, have a hard time believing in God. And if they do believe in God, when it comes to the devil and Satan, that's something they just kind of want to toss out and say, well, we don't believe in the devil. But, but let me tell you something. I believe that the Bible teaches us that everything that is evil, everything that is going wrong in this world, the author of it is the devil. And I believe that his force in this world is much stronger than we want to admit. In fact, when you look at certain things where people operate and act in a way that is completely contrary to nature, you understand that there's an oppressive force that is moving. You know, you, you, sometimes you're reading the news about, you know, a, a, a mom who has basically taken the life of her baby. Can, can I tell you something? There is only one way that happens. That's an oppressive spirit. Listen, I, every mama I know is a mama bear. You touch their kids and they don't care how big you are. They are coming after you. You don't touch their kids. And for a mom, all of a sudden to have this thing where there's this innate ability or an innate desire on the inside of them to protect their children, to take the life of that child, there has to be some major oppression that is happening. 
somewhere where hope has been lost and, and there has been this struggle in their life that they feel overwhelmed with darkness for them to be able to do that. You know, years ago, I don't know if you guys remember about Jeffrey Dahmer. And um, if you don't, he basically was a, a cannibalist. He was eating humans. And uh, it was nasty stuff. And you think, what a dastardly person. But he, I read just a little bit uh, of how he went down that dark path. And he was a pretty average guy until he opened the door to some darkness in his life and he went a place that most humans will never go. How does that happen? Through oppression. Now, we dial that back a ways and we understand that a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with in our life is oppression. And, and here's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you with today. There's a way out. Let, let me say that again. There's a way out. I, I believe that a vast majority of people are facing some form of oppression. Sometimes it's in relationships. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it's in our mind. And, and a lot of us that are walking around, even those people that look like they're okay, that they're, they're having some form of captivity in their spirit. Even Christians who love God many times have not learned how to live in freedom. What I want you to get to and what I want you to understand today is that literally God's will is for you to be free. Amen. That, was, that was decent. But let me try that again. Because I see, we come to church and here's, here's what I want to challenge you with. I think a lot of people have come to church or have been in church and there's been so much tradition that has been jammed down our throat that's not Bible that we don't understand that God's called us to freedom. I said, God's called you to freedom. He's called your marriage to be free. He's called your body to be free. He's called, called your finances to be free. He's called every area of your life to be free. And, and, and we see just a little glimpse of this into Acts 10.38. And there's a scripture where Peter is speaking and he says, you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Now, this is what Jesus did with that power. Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by who? The by the devil. For God was with him. Now, there's a couple things that, that are very important for us to understand. Number one is that Jesus went around doing good. He went around healing those that all those that were oppressed of the devil. So first of all, everyone who wanted to be free got free. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I want to be free, but I'm not sure if it's God's will for me to be free. I'm here to tell you that it is. And I'm here to tell you that you can be free if you understand how to operate in freedom. <laughs> All right. And, and then he went on to say this, that the author of oppression was who? The devil. the devil. All right. The author of the oppression was literally the devil. So when you look at it this way, we need to understand that when God's kingdom is in operation, it brings freedom. When the devil's um, kingdom is in operation, it brings bondage. And here's what I want you to understand, that on this world, it's literally the devil's kingdom. It's the devil's playground. It is not God's. It's the devil's. All right. He is the one that's bringing bondage nine different times in the New Testament, three times from Jesus himself. He called the devil the ruler of this world. Now, how did he become the ruler of this world? Well, Adam gave him that authority in the Garden of Eden. God gave that authority to the devil. And then when, when man sinned, he handed that authority over to the devil and he is operating that authority. God doesn't like what he does, but he's respecting that authority. He gave it to Adam. Adam had free choice what he did with it. See, that's the power that we have is free choice. 
And God lets us do that. We gave it to the devil and everything that's running in this world, the whole world system is wrapped around darkness. It's not God's will for kids to starve. It's not God's will for people to die. It's not God's will for people to be sick and in bondage. So we've been taught that in the church. Well, you know, God's trying to teach you something. No, God wants you to be free. It's God's free, uh, will for you to be free in every area of your life. In fact, when you look at the manifestation of the two kingdoms, it shows you that. Everything that you look at that, that shows or demonstrates God's kingdom, it's always in freedom. When you look at heaven, there's no bondage in heaven. The Bible says there's no pain. It says there's no tears. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There's no sadness. There's no bad days in heaven. Come on, somebody. There's nothing bad about heaven. In fact, we have record. I've um, read about four books about the NDEs. NDEs are near-death experiences. And because of modern science and medicine, there is a lot of people that are dying and are coming back to life. They literally have tens of thousands of records of people dying and coming back to life and people are telling what they're seeing. What one particular person was dying and he was dying and he grabbed the doctor and he says, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell. Lead me to Christ, lead me to Christ. I and mean, he could see it, he's dying. And the doctor went to Sunday school and he didn't even know. And he said, I'm not a preacher. I can't help you. He goes, help me, help me. And he remembered a prayer that he heard in Sunday school when he was a kid. He led the guy in the prayer. And that guy goes, oh, thank you. I, I feel free now. In fact, I see Jesus. And he passed away. This doctor was so enamored by what he saw they started studying near-death experiences. They found out some interesting things. Uh, everybody tells the similar things. There's, the details are different, but there's some focal points that are very similar. A being of light, incredible love like they had never felt before, peace. In, and, and many of them talk about literally meeting Jesus and Jesus talking to them about living their life for him and, and, and how important even their actions with other people are. And they talk about these experiences over and over. One thing you won't find in any of those experiences is heaven's a place of sin, darkness, hurt, or pain. Everybody describes it as a place that is beyond comprehension. I don't want to come back. Why? That's God's kingdom. And that kingdom lives on the inside of you. Let me say that again. That kingdom lives on the inside of you if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, there was a time where Jesus was operating in ministry and John the Baptist, you know, um, he was literally the predecessor before Jesus. He's the one that proclaimed Jesus' coming. And, and he sent his disciples to Jesus just to make sure he was the Messiah. The Messiah was the Jew that was called to come back, the son of God, to literally bring the kingdom of God. And, he's, and they asked him, are you the Messiah? I, I want you to see what Jesus said. He said, Jesus told them in verse four, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. Now, here is what identifies the kingdom of God. The blind see. The lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. It didn't say that there was bondage, that there was sickness. There was freedom from oppression, not oppression. When do you, when do you know the kingdom of God shows up? When oppression is being removed from people's lives. That's when you know the kingdom of God is showing up. On the other hand, you know when the darkness shows up? Because there is oppression. Now, now, why am I sharing this with you? Because, listen, I, I've been a pastor for a long time, and, and my job is to help people. You know, 
I'm not here just to speak a message to you guys. You know, as a church, we want to walk you to success, spiritual success. That's what, that's our desire. But you have to understand if you don't understand that what's been given to you, you can't walk in it. And, and some of the things I've heard people say over the years, I realize where people are at. Like, I've heard this from people. You know, something bad happens. Many times they've lost a loved one or, or something, they've got a bad diagnosis. or just life has dealt them a really bad hand. And they'll make this statement, why did God let this happen? Why did he let this happen? I, I, here's what I want you to understand. God is not the author of those things. He prov already provided for you everything you need for life and godliness. Amen. He's already provided for you everything you need to be victorious over the problems of life. But you have a part to play in it. And when, when sometimes... I'm going to say it's just bad stuff happens. We live in a, in a fallen world, a dark world. Sometimes it's not anybody's fault. Stuff just happens. I want that to be clear. But it's not God who is the author of it. God wants freedom. God wants life. But there's other things that are happening in our life. And, and if we're not careful, we just, we just say, oh, man, you know what? God changed this. Change this, change that, change. I've had people come up to me and say, change my spouse, which that's a really, <laughs> not a good prayer. I'm just saying, probably not going to work that way. All right. Change this, change that. And, and, and then I heard, I heard this particular comment by somebody. They said, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. Now, I don't know if you've said that. Maybe you've heard someone else who has said that. But again, that's not scriptural. If God wants it to happen, then it'll happen. Can I tell you something? God's will doesn't always happen. <laughs> Some of you like, I'm going to throw you out of the church. <laughs> what are you saying? He's all powerful. Yes, he's all powerful, but there's authority and rules and he follows those things. Listen, let me give you a couple passages, okay? Let's go to, to 1 Timothy 2, 3, and it says this, this is good and acceptable on the sight of God our Savior. Verse 4, who desires all men to be saved? Now, if God desires for all men to be saved, it's his will. Amen? Amen. It's God's will that every person ever born on this earth gets saved but they're not. You know why? Because of free will. They have a choice. Let, 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 me, let me share something with you. I'm going to slow down here a little bit. I'm, I'm going to go a little different direction than I did in the first service. Um, when I, 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 I was going to Bible school and I was working at this grocery store and I, I led this guy to the Lord one day and, and this guy got on fire for God and, and so... Um, the next night, you know, I, I, I had gone to school in the morning, then worked eight hours. It's 11 o'clock at night. I'm exhausted. I got to get up the next morning, go to school. And I hear this knock at my apartment door. And I look and it's the guy who I got saved the, the night before. This guy's six foot five. And he's got his best friend by the scruff of the neck. And he looks at me. He goes, he needs to get saved too. And he throws him into my living room. And, you know, you don't have much choice. I said, okay, okay, so let's pray. So I started talking to the guy, and the guy wasn't really wanting to get saved. Now, now I want you to listen to this. There, there's a scripture in Luke that says that a bunch of people were gathered. I'm not going to go through the details. The power of God was there to heal them, but none of them got healed except for one. It's a different guy. I'm in this room with this guy, and, and I'm talking to him, and I literally, you know, talk to him about getting saved. And here's what he says. I want to go to heaven, but I want to have some major fun first. And the kind of fun I want to have is not godly. 
And I, you know, and I did the whole thing of don't worry about the after. Just, just accept God in your heart. Let him change you. He, he knew better. He's like, nope. I said, can we at least pray? So I'm praying. This guy who just got saved, this guy could pray already. And listen, I'm in my living room. I don't know if you've ever had this experience before, but the power of God falls. Have you ever experienced that before? It's beautiful. It's like you can feel his presence, not just on the inside, but on the outside. And it's, it's just full of joy. It's full of peace. And, and it's powerful. And I could feel the power. And I look over at this guy who, who we're trying to get saved. He is shaking like this. You could tell the power of God's all over him. And I looked at him after we got through praying. I said, did you feel the power? He goes, yeah, that was amazing. I said, now do you want to get saved? He goes, no. God moved. Are you, see, are you seeing that? God moved, yet nothing happened in his life long term because he refused it. See, we don't even understand that sometimes in our life, because we, the devil has fooled us and deceived us, God's power is right there to minister to us, and we turn around and we walk away because we don't believe it's ours. Let, let me give you another scripture. All right? Um, two blind guys come to Jesus, and they said, would you heal us? And Jesus said, do you believe? And they said, yes, we do. Look at, look at Matthew 9, 29. Then he touched their eyes saying, it shall be done to you according to your faith. Now, now let me stop right here. Here's what Jesus just said. You will be healed of your blindness if you believe. It wasn't Jesus's faith. It was his faith. Are, are you with me? It was his faith. His faith determined the outcome. If he doesn't have the faith, guess what? He's not getting healed. He gets healed. Why? Because he believes. All right, let me try another story. It's all right. It's all good. I understand. You know, sometimes you, you share things like this, and I, I, it's the same way, you know, in, in McAllen. Sometimes I'll be one service, and people just hook right into it, and the next service, it's like, they kind of do like this, and part of the reason why, it's like, this is so new to some people. It's like, this is opposite of what we've been taught, and I remember the first time I got taught this, and I was taught the other way, and somebody started telling me I could be healed. I could be set free. It, it, it was determined by my faith. I kind of went like this, but there was something in, inside my heart that was hungry for it. There was something that spoke to me. There was something that hooked up with it, and, and it changed my life. And, 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 I, and I've seen God's power move. Man, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen cancer healed. I've seen my, my son, who they, they, they basically gave overnight to, to live. To, you know, he had to gain so much weight, gain double that. And I just saw miracles happen. I've seen it over and over and over. You know, I've seen a broken leg that was bro broke a week before healed the night when we laid hands on somebody. I've seen somebody healed from leukemia. I mean, doctor basically said, you got leukemia. They go back the next day, take all the tests. They don't have it. I saw a man walk up to me, wasn't even saved, wasn't even saved, had a heart condition that was so bad, he had to quit his job. God told me to lay hands on him. I went down and I laid hands on him. The power of God hit the guy. He fell over backwards. He sat there, started, got saved, started praying in tongues. I didn't even pray for him to get pray in tongues. And then he got healed. You say, well, pastor, how do you know? Because he went back to the doctor and the doctor said, what in the world happened to you? He goes, I don't know. I went to this church and they prayed for me. He didn't even believe, hardly believe in God, but he did after that. God has started working again. Why? Because God's power is available and working for each and every one of us. Amen. So what we have to learn to do is to operate in faith. But we have to understand that it's God's will. It's God's will for us to be set free. And the only way that we can receive that, that power is by believing his word. 
Let me share another story real quick. And there's a story in, in Mark talking about the woman with the issue of blood. And uh, she'd been bleeding for many, many years, the Bible said, and she had, this sounds like probably some of us, said she had spent all of her money on the doctors, but she got worse. And she heard about Jesus. She heard about him. And then she said, if I go and touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. That was her place of faith. So Jesus is walking through the place. Here's this woman. She's not even supposed to be out in public because of this disease. And she sees Jesus. Now, now, now I want you to get this picture. There's a crowd all around him. He's famous by this time. People have been raised from the dead. People have been healed. People just want to touch him. Everybody's just trying to get a touch of, the, of Jesus. And this woman walks up and she grabs a hold of the hem of his garment. And Jesus turns around and goes, who touched me? And the disciples are going, everybody's touching you. What are you talking about? Amen. Now listen to me. This is so good. But he, the Bible says he felt the power leave him. And the woman looked and said, it's me. And he looks at her and says, your faith has made you whole. Jesus didn't even know she was there. He was the container for the power, but she touched it by faith. Everybody else is touching him. There's no power going out. Come on. Now, now, now stay with me. See, if we're not careful, we go to church and we do our thing. We got and saved. We have salvation faith. We, we believe God that we're no longer going to hell and we're going to heaven. But, but we haven't really been taught that God will, will prosper my business. We really haven't been taught that God will heal my marriage. We haven't been taught that he'll heal my body. We've been taught that if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. So we just kind of float along and we go, God, why don't you do this? And God, why don't you do that? And God, why don't you do this? Well, I guess it must not be his will. And we start accepting way below oppressive um, circumstances because we don't touch him by faith. But see, there has to be something on the inside of us every day of our life that we understand that we're called to something greater. We're called to something greater. It's called freedom. God's called us to a place of freedom that our freedom is so expressive in our life that people see it, they know it, they feel it, they touch it. It changes people's lives around us because we're walking in freedom. But see, you're not going to walk in freedom by just touching Jesus. Oh, I came to church and just got a little touch. Just got a little touch. You know, I felt worship. I got a little touch. See, there's something on the inside of you that you got to fight for it. Let me say it again. You got to fight for it. How, how many of you, when you were younger, you were fighters? See, uh, we got a girl right here and a woman. Right here. Women. The women are fighters. All of them. All guys are just watching the women. All right. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, but listen, have you, you, you notice a lot of times the fighters that win aren't necessarily the better fighters. They're the more intense fighters. They're the ones that won't give up. They're the ones that you smack them in the face. They just light up more. <laughs> you know, l l let me read a passage, a couple passages to you. I, wa I want to, you know, I want to read... Um, a if you go back to Ephesians 6, 12, it says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood. Okay, let's go to 1 Timothy 6, 12. It says to fight the good fight of faith for the true faith. It says to fight, I will just, you, can, you can read the rest of it yourself. Fight the good fight of faith. See, we've, there's a part of us that's been taught to be passive in our faith towards God. And I'm here to tell you that you're going to have to be aggressive with your faith. Amen. You know, the, I mean, when I was um, growing up, I, I loved to play football. How, how many football players in the room? 
All right. There's something about, you know, more football players here. All right. You know, something about football that I love. It wasn't that I was a good athlete because I wasn't. But it was something about the, the combat that I loved. And it's like I was the type of person that if you hit me in the face, I'm going to hit you back harder. And there was other people that you hit them in the face. I'm not literally. We're just talking, you know, metaphorically. You hit them in the face. They're just like they quit. And, and, and I'm going to tell you this quick story to use an illustration to help you. But um, I, I was a youth pastor, my second position. So I'm in my mid-20s. And uh, of course, you know, football's long, go, long be gone in my life, but I still enjoyed it. So I had a large youth group. We probably had about 400 kids and, um, and we had a whole bunch of leaders. And so what we did, it was every um, year... The Saturday before Thanksgiving, we had a turkey bowl. This is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so sometimes it's even cold. And uh, we'd have a turkey bowl. It was flag football. And it was the leaders versus uh, the youth. And the youth sometimes would be even college and career age. And we had some really good athletes. We had some scholarship college players. They were small college, but they were still scholarship um, college players. Um, on our team, we actually had someone who was the offensive tackle for the Seattle Seahawks. So we didn't have to worry about, I mean, he was, he was retired, but he was still big and, uh, didn't have to worry about that side of the line. And so we're playing flag football and, and it would get intense. It was intense enough. We had to hire referees. So we hired referees. So one day, you know, I'm playing, now I, I want you to understand this. I am not really that athletic at all. This guy is running the ball. This guy is three, four times better athlete than I am. Has a scholarship to a small college. He's running around the corner and, and I cut him off and there's a couple guys behind me so he has nowhere to go and it's flag football. I'm, supposed to, I'm reaching down to get the flag and he ducks his shoulder and starts heading towards me, gonna run me over. Now, what's your response to that? Well, I know what my response is. My response, now I'm the youth pastor, I remind you. <laughs> my response is to dip my shoulder and I'm going to one-up him. And I literally, because I, I couldn't get his flag because he ducked his shoulder. And so I come down and I, I hit him and I grab his legs, I pick him up in the air and I slam him on the ground in love. <laughs> right? Flags are flying everywhere because the youth pastor just took down, a, you know, one of the, the youth. And, and so then the kid, you know, he, at this point, his eyes are all lit up. I'm, I'm all lit up, you know. And he looks at me and goes, I've known you were going to do that. I ran you over. I said, dude, I'm here all day, man. <laughs> Three plays later, same kid. I don't know why, why it was he and I, but, you know, we go back to pass. I'm blocking. And, and he is he's such a much better athlete that he looks at and he cuts and I can't keep up with him. I'm losing this guy. He's about to go get my quarterback. But because of my tenacity, I'm not going to let him do that. So I leave my feet and I dive and I hit him right, it hurt, it hit right here on me and I caught his thigh and I flipped him up in the air. And he landed on his back and we scored a touchdown that play. And I was pretty excited and kind of going like, oh, that really hurt, you know. But guess what? He quit playing. He played. He never rushed again. He ran the other way. It's like he, he stayed away from me. I got in his head. Now, now, now here's what I'm, I'm not proud of that moment or anything, but I'm, I'm here to make a, a point. That's exactly what the devil's doing to you. Right. See, this kid is so much better than me. Should have wiped the floor with me. All he had to do was make some adjustments. I couldn't keep up. I made a couple plays, but he would have wiped the floor with me. But, but I metaphorically popped him across the face. And he quit. Listen, I, I, I'm gonna, I want you to hear this. As a pastor, I see this all the time. People quit. And I don't, when I say quit, I don't mean like you quit Christianity. Like you quit trying. I see men who shut down. It's like family's not going well. I'm done. I'm just going to go do my thing. 
hang out with my bros. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I see women get frustrated and they, they just start doing natural things. And why? Because things aren't going right. And, and what we don't realize what we're doing is we're giving up our faith. See, what we have to go back is the promises of God. The answers in your life are the promises of God. The answers in your life are the promises of God. The answers in your life are the promises of God. They're the promises of God. See, and you don't say it one time and go, well, I sure hope God comes through. It's like, you got to stand. You know, 27 years ago, God told me to come down to the Rio Grande Valley. I had no idea what I was doing. I'm in my early 30s. You know, I had been a youth pastor for nine years, never pastored a church before. The church I was coming to was called Church of the Good Shepherd at the time. It's this church. We changed the name, thank God. Anyway, and it was called Church of the Good Shepherd. And um, they had 60 people. The average age was in their 60s. That's not bad. I'm 60. And, but they were in their 60s, had no kids. They were an evil bunch, especially the board. They had literally split a church, the, the church, and they had chased away four or five pastors. I had people take me out for a meal and say, I just want to meet you before you leave because nobody laughs at this church. Had all my friends tell me later, didn't tell me at the time, they saw the church in this condition and they said, you'll never make it. And 27 years later, we have 4,000 people, two campuses, about to go to a third campus. What happened? What, what happened? Was it because I was really good? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's it. God told me to come. He said, come. I said, okay. I, I was stupid enough just to obey, obey God. I didn't question it. I didn't try to figure out why. Come on, somebody. I didn't, I didn't try to understand it. I didn't go ask a bunch of people. I, God said, go. I said, okay, I'll go. And I watched God do miracles. I mean, this board was, was so bad that they would get in fights with each other. And I remember God told me we were supposed to do something. And, and I knew that half the board wouldn't want to do it. And, and we're getting ready for a board meeting. And all of a sudden, I'm just praying. The Spirit of God comes on me. And I just start praying. And, and I'm, I'm like, okay, I didn't even know why. I just prayed. God didn't say anything. I just prayed. It was just intense. I'm in the meeting. And, and I say, this is what I feel like is a directive from God. Half the board turned against me. I mean, they're, th th this is bad. It's literally getting to the place of either I'm going to stay here or I'm going to quit. But I had know what God told me to do. I wasn't going to quit. They were going to have to push me out. All of a sudden, in the middle of the meeting, one of the guys who was a lawyer took my side. I don't, to this day, know why. I do. And he said, that's enough of this. He's the pastor and we're going to follow him. Two of the board members left. Thank God. And, and it established what God wanted to do in the thing. And we went and did it. Now, it wasn't this guy was all that angelic. A year and a half later, he tried to kick me out. God would raise up two other people to stand up against him. I didn't have to do any of it. And I had people, like you go to conferences, and I know some of you don't understand this, but you go to church conferences and they hear about, you know, a church that was almost dead, that was raised up like ours has been, and people want to know, how did you do it? People want to know, what's the formula? What's this? And I never know how to answer them. And finally, one day, I said, I just don't know. And then I finally figured out what it is. It's faith. It's faith. I, I was going through, a, I, I'm going to close with this. I was going through a hard time about a month ago with some stuff was happening in, in, in our church and just in our staff and different things. And, 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 I, and it was just, you know, you don't want to talk to me, you just feel down. You know, you just, you've been hit across the mouth a few times. Come on. 
You know, somebody's picked you up and slammed you, it feels like, spiritually. And, and you're just like, man, is, is there a solution? Is there, you know, and, and I'm sitting there and I'm, come on. I, I, you look at me right now and say, Pastor, you look so bold. Yeah, but I have my whiny moments just like you do. And I was having one of those whiny moments. Like, God, this is hard. Is this tough? Maybe, maybe my time here is just, you know, maybe it's time to slow down a little bit and, you know, and just, you know, and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, something came up. Listen, God wants to do this in your life today. Something came up in my spirit right here. You know what it was? It was the spirit of faith. And that, and that scripture says the spirit of faith came to my heart. And it said this, it, it says this, that I believe, therefore I speak. See, and I, and I realized God said to me, you, you came here because of the spirit of faith. See, this whole church was, was birthed back in the 1940s in a healing revival where people came out of wheelchairs, they came out of crutches, people were set free from alcohol, miracles were happening all over the place. They started having church 365 days out of the year and this church was birthed out of that. Then in the 80s, it reached 1,500 people and it's zenith and then this board struck and literally broke the church and, and locked the, the power pastor out and by the time I got it it was down to 60 people and God said to this to me he says this church was born in the spirit of faith and it was resurrected in the spirit of faith and it'll go to the next generation the spirit of faith and I knew right then it was like man we got to get on our faith see God wants to resurrect some things in your life but it's, it's going to have to be this thing where you get up and you begin to speak the promises of God. I believe, therefore I speak. You need to start speaking healing over your marriage. You need to start speaking health to your children, that your kids are coming back to Jesus. You need to speak health over your finances. You need to start speaking over your own mind and your emotions and declare what the Bible has to say. You need to take back what the devil has stolen from you. It's time for us as a church to rise up. Yes. See, as a church, I want you to understand this. I'm tired of talking about the move of God. We're going to see blind eyes see. We're going to see the lame walk. Come on, we're going to see the deaf hear. We're going to see marriages restored. We're going to see people rise up and take their position in the body of Christ and live for something bigger than themselves. That's who we are at TFC. That's what God's called you to be. God has not called you to be beneath. He's called you to be over on top. He's called you to be blessed coming in and blessed going out. God's called you to these things. And I'm sitting there. It was my day off. And God speaks these things to me, the spirit of faith. And ever since that time, every morning I get up, I start talking to myself. This is who I am. So where we're going. Oh, I got one final story. I told it. I, I, re I remember I, I, was, I was a youth pastor in my first position. And we had this, you know, we had about 40, 50 kids in there. And I felt like God told me we were going to see some, some expansion. And... Um, I kept telling the youth group this. You know, God's going to do some incredible things. We're going to see people get saved. We're going to see miracles happen. I won't tell you the whole story, but I want to tell you, I had this little junior hire girl, and she was just one of those girls, you know, just kind of a little smart aleck. And she'd walk over to me like this, and <laughs> she goes, you know, I'm so tired. For six months, you've been saying that God's going to do something, and nothing's happening. And I wanted to pick her up and pile driver, but you know, I didn't, I, 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 I didn't. I thought that was, you know, I learned my lesson by then. And I looked at her and I said, wait and see. And I kept saying it, I kept saying, it took about another six months, God exploded in that place. I'll just say this, we had a church of 500, our youth group was 140. We saw lives transformed, lives changed broken people turned around. We, we go to youth camp and we start playing the music and kids just start ministering the power of God fall. Man, I'm hungry for that. Come on, stand to your feet. How many of you are hungry for that? But let me tell you this. There's a junior higher in your life. <laughs> Say, no, you know, you, you've been saying this for a long time. Just keep saying it. Amen. Just keep believing it. 
It's a spirit of faith. It breaks the spirit of oppression. Father, I pray for every person in the room right now. I pray for your power to flow. But more than anything, Father, I pray that people will ignite their faith. People have walked in here. Maybe they've never been heard a message like this. Maybe they've been discouraged, despondent. Father, that hope would rise up, that boldness would rise up. You said in your word that we're to come boldly, not me. You said boldly to the throne of grace. Father, why? Because our faith speaks. And Father, I just speak faith over every family right now. I speak healing in the homes. I thank you for marriages being restored, things that have been broken, things that have been shattered, that look like there's no way out. God's going to restore it if we'll believe. I I just feel that in my heart right now. There's restoration. There's some brokenness if we'll dare to believe that's going to begin to happen in lives. I believe there's people in this room that have gotten a negative report about their body that we just speak healing over them right now. The power of healing. We curse sickness right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for a spirit of faith, spirit of hope, spirit of peace, a spirit of joy in our lives. Lord, we thank you for this. Now, with every head battery, every eye closed, no one looking around. You're here today and say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm right with God. I don't know that if I face death right now that I go to heaven. Listen, the beautiful news is Jesus loves you and that he went to the cross as a perfect sacrifice with the blood of God running through his veins. And he died upon the cross and he shed that blood to pay for all of your sickness, sin, shortcomings, and to purchase freedom for you. It's available to the entire world. And the Bible says that we receive that by believing and speaking. And when we believe and speak it, the Bible says a miracle happens. Jesus forgives us from every sin we've ever done. He comes to live on the inside of us and heaven's our eternal home. Maybe you're here and you've never accepted Jesus and for the first time you need to. Or maybe you're here and say, one time I accepted Jesus, but I've fallen away from God and I need to come back. Listen, if that's you, you need to come to God for the first time or come back to him. Would well, you just right where you're at, just stick your hand up nice and high all over the building. Just put your hand up nice and high. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, see, see that hand, see that hand? Yeah, hands going up. That's wonderful. Just put them up nice and high. Wave at me. Yeah, 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 I see those hands. That's, that's awesome. Anybody else? That's great. That's great. There's a number of you raising your hands. You can put your hands down. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to lead everybody out in prayer. I want everybody in the room to repeat this prayer nice and loud. Those people who raise their hands, listen, when you say these words, you make a decision in your heart. That's what faith is. I choose Jesus. I choose to make him the Lord of my life. I repent of my old life, the old way I used to do things. And I'm I'm going to turn it over to Jesus, to the new way. And even though I don't understand it all, I'm going to start that journey today. And the Bible says if you do that right now, an instant miracle happens. An instant miracle where you are forgiven. He comes to live on the inside of you. And heaven's your eternal home. Everybody repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus that he died for me. I repent of my old life. And I ask you to come into my heart and to save me right now. I receive you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. I thank you because of my confession that I am forgiven, that you live in me, that heaven's my eternal home. I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give it up for those who received Christ.